Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Divergent Perspectives on Micro-Credentials. Uh, my name is Don Eldridge with eCampus Ontario. I'm a digital learning assist, uh, associate on the programs and services team. Uh, joining me today in moderating uh, this event is Nick Baker, uh, Director of the Office of Open Learning at the University of Windsor. So welcome, uh, Nick. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to hand over the panel to you and sit back and enjoy the show. Welcome. Thank you, Don. Thanks so much for uh, for that intro. Um, thank you also to everyone for being here and to my panelists who are joining us today. Um, we have four panelists uh, who will be speaking to this topic. Julia Denham is the Dean of Lifelong Learning at Simon Fraser University. Uh, we have Suhail Patel, who is the Associate Dean of Learning Innovation at Bow Valley College. Uh, Dan Piedra, who is an Assistant Director at McMaster University's Con Continuing Education. Uh, and Lisa Willihan, who's a Professor at the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education at University of Toronto. Welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, the format of our panel today, we're going to talk, uh, we, we have a series of questions that we'd like to work our way through. And then, of course, uh, leave some time for questions at the end. So I'm going to ask my first question uh, to Dan to lead us off. And the question is, what do you see as the potential impact of new credentialing structures on academia? Thank you, Nick. I'm just going to share my screen here to just take you through my response. You see that? Good. You're coming through. Uh, perfect. Okay, great. So yeah, essentially what I'd like to focus it, it on is how um, the, the, di the digital credential part of a micro-credential uh, and, and essentially how that can help to really uh, dismantle and rebuild structures around how we recognize learning. So the first thing that I, I wanted to mention is just the, just the, the sheer uh, growth, the recent growth of uh, open digital badges and other such digital credentials has made it possible to provide students with a tangible tool owned by learner that clearly communicates the proficiency, not only in theory and skills related to their chosen subject area, but also in soft skills. Now, this is a very different mindset than traditional credentials when one thinks about a digital credential and what it can do. Um, and, you know, it, the, the traditional credential as reflected in an institutional transcript is what I'm referring to. Uh, the gatekeeper of such information is the institution. Students must apply to access uh, and, and to share this information whenever they wish to distribute it with another academic institution or a potential employer, even though one could argue that it is theirs from the very beginning, and yet they're often forced to pay a fee for access to that information. Uh, the information itself is guarded and only released upon very specific conditions, uh, which the learner must uh, abide by. Moreover, uh, the information which is eventually made available upon approval of academic institution only serves to confirm what courses and grades an individual has achieved and provides very little information that might be useful to a potential employer. Now, open digital badges uh, and other forms of alternative digital credentials shift that balance of power of information, which is really a key concept of critical pedagogy, from the academic institution to the student who owns it and can use it with, whom, with whomever they, they wish uh, without having to go through a long process of asking to access to what is rightfully theirs. Uh, digital credentials also empower learners by giving them a more effective tool to communicate one's academic accomplishments and as well, they go well beyond the information on most institutional transcripts through the metadata that's incorporated therein. Uh, the metadata of most digital credentials will provide information on the issuing body, the description of skill or achievement, providing context, level of achievement, assessment procedures, the criteria required to qualify for the credential, and in some cases, evidence or samples of the work that was completed. So overall, an alternative digital credential, uh, I feel, can liberate students from a history of reliance on traditional uh, credentials and institutional transcripts, which lack that rich detail of a digital credential. These credentials empower learners to more effectively communicate their abilities and proficiencies in all aspects of their academic experience. An open digital credential places the power of achievement with all of its trans, uh, transparent details 
uh, with the owner and provides a tool for career success not previously available. Uh, consistent with the spirit of critical digital pedagogy, alternative digital credentials empower students to be engaged and thoughtful participants in their own learning and career development. And I think that's a wonderful uh, opportunity for all of us who are now beginning to dabble with micro-credentials, but more specifically with the digital credential that one can issue. Thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks for kicking us off that way. Um, I think uh, I think in, I'd like to jump to our next question. Uh, these tie together nicely, and uh, if we have any other comments and feedback through the from the uh, from the panel, we might jump in in the middle of that, or just at the end of that, I should say. But our next question that I'd like us to, to address. Um, uh, so Hale's going to lead us off on that. The question is: Shouldn't micro credentials help us to eliminate inefficiencies in the education system by stacking learning and avoiding time spent relearning the same material over and over? Are we there yet? Um, what barriers do you think still exist? to realizing this benefit? Great, thanks so much. Great question, Nick. Um, there, So there's like two questions actually in that, or maybe more actually. And one part is very obvious and one is perhaps not really asked, but I think it's important to address. So on the one hand, it is like absolutely about eliminating inefficiencies. And you know, one way that this is being done is that I think most of us can agree that micro-credentials should be competency-based, which would require some sort of competency assessment. If a learner is competent in that area, then like why not give the learner the credential? Why force them to sit or you know and either you know learn or just spend time on uh, course content, for instance, that is not going to have any kind of impact on them. If a learner is then, you know, if we do this right, if a learner is not competent, then we work with them to, to focus on areas of need. Wherever the gaps exist, we work towards addressing those gaps um, with the overall sort of idea that we want them to succeed. I believe that a lot of institutions are already doing this, or they're well on their way to doing this. But I think on the other hand, it's more than just about removing or reducing inefficiencies. It's also about looking at perhaps what is working and amplifying areas where we think our efforts uh, will lead to significant value, where we know that for the learner, they're going to get something really meaningful out of this if we just take something that currently works and you try to make it significantly better. Um, what if there are places that were really efficient, but we could still be doing some amazing things? Those are the kinds of questions I think we don't, we don't really ask, or you know, the question that is maybe hiding within this bigger question. When it comes to barriers, the part the part that can often be missed, I think, is the method we're using to assess and eliminate inefficiencies. If we're, as academic institutions, if we're reducing inefficiencies or removing inefficiencies only to then download them onto employers, I, I don't think that's the right thing to do. You know, and so, for example, if we are creating a competency-based micro-credential and the assessment is something that's easy for um, institutions to execute uh, and it's very efficient, we can either sort of automate it or we can make it really quick. But then when the learner goes to the employer and says, look, I have this micro-credential, you know, you should hire me, um, you know, based on this micro-credential, I, I seem to be very competent. And then employers and the learner, they, they realize that, oh my goodness, you know, you're, although your micro credential is saying you're competent, the work or what you're doing in the workforce is perhaps not um, on par with what we expected. And so this is, I think, you know, there's a, there's a tension that exists there and something that uh, we, need to, we need to consider. The other part of the barrier and this is more of a systematic, I think, educational problem in general, is that assessments can be intimidating. 
And an assessment first approach can be extremely intimidating. The most, I think, difficult part of that, the most challenging sort of barrier to overcome is going to be how do we create a culture where assessment first is a good idea or it's a great idea? How do we create a culture where assessment is not about how good you are at something, but it's more about how can we help you develop you know, your competence in a specific area so you can be great at something? Uh, this is a cultural shift I think that needs to take place. And I think this is something that we need to all really carefully uh, consider. Um, you know, and, and just from, you know, my own experience, just from, I think, the, the, the team that uh, I'm, you know, proudly, you know, working with in the college, like, this is something we take really seriously. This is, like, let's make it efficient, but let's make it amazing. Let's, you know, reduce sort of the barriers that currently exist, but create, a, create an amazing culture around this idea of assessment. So, uh, uh, yeah, this is sort of the way we think about things. Wonderful. Thanks, Sahil. Uh, panelists, any response to either of those initial thoughts? Are there any things that, that jump out at you that uh, you want to talk about? Thanks for the opportunity to respond, Nick. I, I think that the, the concerns around who is responsible for training uh, people to have industry specific skills and whether it's the responsibility of post-secondary institutions to provide that training is a question that is beyond our ability to answer in this particular context. Uh, it's not a new question. Um, I do think that we have a, a really interesting opportunity as Dan has pointed out to provide learners with the ability to demonstrate their learning in a way that they haven't been able to do before. And I mean, this has always been my point that what distinguishes micro credentials from everything that we've been doing on the non-credit side of education or the somewhat less than certificate length of um, education for many, many, many years, it's not new. What's new is the documentation and the credentialing and the ability for the learners to point to something that says, I have demonstrated ability to do the following things gained through this particular um, program of study. Thanks, Julia. Uh, any other thoughts or anyone else want to jump in? So uh, uh, I don't know if I'm live, I think I'm live. Um, I, I just wanna ask the question back then, right? I think uh, Julia, um, whose responsibility should it be? Like, I'm, I'm just curious, like I wanna, I, I'm just interested in learning actually whose responsibility should be when it comes to sort of training the workforce or, you know, developing talent. Well, I'm pretty sure there's a PhD dissertation in that question. Um, but I, I mean, I think the answer is it depends. It, it depends on what your vision is for what post-secondary education is versus potentially what it should be or could be or is maybe transforming into. Uh, is post-secondary education a public good that increases the well-being of an educated well-being and um, opportunity and ability to do things like think critically for um, to contribute to the overall betterment of society, or is post-secondary education um, the way that you get skills for a job? And I mean, those are ham-fisted summaries, obviously, but I think you can't answer the should uh, necessarily without really having a conversation about what is post-secondary? Is skills training um, and um, upskilling and reskilling using all of the, let's get the cliches out. Um, is that the purview of post-secondary institutions within regular quote unquote for credit studies? Or is it perhaps the purview of post-secondary education, educational institutes in the non-credit realm? Or is it the purview of, of employers? And I mean, where should it be? probably a combination of all of those things. But I think where, and I mean, I'm kind of anticipating a bit, but I think where I hear concerns from faculty colleagues about micro-credentialing is the, the potential 
for micro credentials to somehow dismantle or disrupt the um, I think really important goal of the university as a place of higher learning and a place where we um, you know expose people to knowledge in service of the greater good, not necessarily in service of what might be called the capitalist enterprise. Well, I think that's a great segue to the question that I wanted to pose to you, Julia. So uh, maybe we'll we'll do that now. Um, you know, you mentioned the the concerns that are coming from faculty colleagues. Uh, to what extent do you think faculty groups and unions are, you know, perhaps influencing the direction that micro credentials can and should take inside institutions? And um, you know, who are teaching these things? Who should be teaching them? How do we recognize those things as part of the academic enterprise? Yeah, thanks, Nick. The, the question's an interesting one. And I'll start by saying, if, if, if this is something that rang really excited bells in your head as a, as a person participating, I would point you to the CUFA BC white paper that came out in March 2021. Uh, on micro-credentials. It's uh, specific to CUFA BC, um, Canadian uh, Confederation of University Faculty Associations is the acronym. Um, it's, it's really interesting and presents, I think, a, a thoughtful and quite useful uh, position on micro-credentials from the faculty perspective, because in British Columbia, at least, and I certainly think there are lots of other places across the country, the cases that micro-credentials, as we've been loosely defining them, are primarily delivered through a non, uh, continuing studies divisions. And the majority, although by no means all, have kind of been non-credit. And there's just this tension right now between credit and non-credit. So where faculty groups and unions get interested in this conversation is when it appears that micro-credentialing is related to discipline-specific knowledge that is typically housed in a faculty or a particular discipline. And where I um, also see faculty getting kind of behind micro-credentialing in a way that I actually find kind of concerning, but there is some, some conversation around the potential to break degrees down into smaller components and micro-credential and somehow stack up to a degree. And that's a whole other area of conversation. Um, I don't personally support that as, as the vision for what we're trying to do here. I think this is a, a much different enterprise. The question around who's teaching them is that the people who are teaching micro-credentials primarily um, in my experience and context are subject matter experts. So that may be faculty, but that may also be practitioners who are working in various fields because micro-credentials do not constrain themselves to the traditional disciplines that are housed in faculties in the, the usual kind of university. So there are ways of um, contracting with subject matter experts that are very different than working in a faculty contract where you've got, or a faculty context where you have faculty association and other potential union concerns. And there are lots of tensions about that, right? The, the union non-union uh, con, uh, conflict is often a bone of contention. Um, how they contribute to workload in many institutions so that if faculty are teaching in a micro-credential space, they do that on an additional pay or somehow on a contracted basis that takes them over and above uh, their faculty contract. And then with subject matter experts, of course, we would negotiate a contract um, around their instructional or instru a subject matter expert um, contribution to program design, for instance. Thanks, Julia. Those are uh, really interesting perspectives and I want to come back to them. Um, but I did want to ask this question of Lisa first, and that is, what's the difference between micro-credentials and continuing ed? Um, they seem like they're be, those terms get used interchangeably. They're, they often sit in, in, uh, in the continuing ed space. And what are the potential problems that could arise as we kind of rush after this micro-credential realm? Well, thanks. Thanks, Nick. I think that um, on the face of it, that institutions like um, universities and colleges have been offering short term certificates and other credentials for more than 100 years. Um, and there are differences between the sectors in what that entails. And arguably, from my perspective, um, credentials offered by colleges are closer to the notion of micro credentials than those offered by university continuing ed, ed, ed departments. 
Now, when we look at universities, um, they've been offering continuing ed for more than 100 years. And um, it's been primarily to open access to those who haven't been able to participate in education for uh, whatever reason, to provide access to education for personal development and for work. And um, since I came to Canada in 2014, um, I've actually participated in these. I've, I've studied French, you know, at the University of Toronto Continuing Education. So I, I think there's a big role for all of that sort of provision. But there is a difference, I think, between micro-credentials and programs that have traditionally been offered by university continuing ed departments and to a lesser degree um, in colleges. And the first difference is their curricular focus. And the second is the language of accreditation, which is expressed through the word credential. So continuing ed um, departments and universities have traditionally offered a broad range of certificates beyond preparation for the labour market, um, including languages, creative writing, music, philosophy and the humanities more broadly, um, as well as those focused on broad professional development. Now, in contrast, micro-credentials are uh, designed to explicitly be skills focused, competency based credentials. And while universities in Ontario have had broad learning outcomes for some years, there is arguably a much tighter focus on workplace requirements. And the second difference between continuing ed and micro credentials is that there are increasing policy attempts to mainstream and incorporate micro credentials into formally recognised qualifications frameworks or accreditation, validation, or recognition um, systems. And so the language of a accreditation, credit, counting, stacking, all of that sort of thing is, is quite different. And this has implications for quality assurance, quality control and accreditation that I hope that we discuss. Now, colleges have long offered short-term programs more focused on the labour market, but even here, um, the emphasis on, emphasis on accreditation, counting and stacking um, is different. And I think, um, this poses challenges for colleges, more for colleges than it does for universities, although I think in the grand scheme of things, college is a better place often to offer these types of credentials. And so in, in our work, we've problematised micro-credentials, not because we're concerned with this or that micro-credential, each on their own is quite fine. Um, the problem for us is the policy focus and how they're being used to reorient and move our systems of education um, for, uh, to workplace training. And I think that, and this is, um, I'm picking up on some things that Julia was talking about, that policy is trying to pick up the gap in workplace training. Employers have in Canada, Australia, the US, England, the UK, have systematically disinvested in workplace training over many years. And I've got no problems whatsoever with employers funding and offering any program they deem relevant uh, for their workplace, but micro-credentials aren't that so much. If they were, that would be fine. So micro-credentials shift the risk to governments and to individuals, and individuals have to second-guess the requirements of the labour market so that they're perpetually ready for any new skill or job that's needed. And in this way, micro-credentials contribute to precarity in the labour market by shifting the risk to individuals. They also pose, I think, risk to the educational enterprise more broadly. And in our work, we've argued that a credential is more than the sum of its parts. Um, and that the idea that you can make up a credential by um, adding bits up, uh, it won't result in a credential that has depth or coherence. They help to fragment qualifications or credentials and undermine notions of hierarchy and sequencing. So the problem is not this or that micro-credential, it's the broader policy context, how they are funded and who has to bear the risk. If individuals are going to be able to access and move in the labour market, then they need to have a meaningful credential that has personal value, value in the labour market that allows them to enter the labour market and move progress within it as a basis for further study and for citizenship. And the outcomes in our societies for those who don't have a meaningful post-school qualification um, or credential are dreadful. So micro-credentials may be fine um, for those who've already um, got these types of credentials, but they can never be a substitute or an alternative to credentials. And the risk is that they reorient our sectors to focus more on short-term workplace training than longer-term um, capacity building for individuals, enterprises, and society more broadly. 
Thanks, Lisa. I have so many questions for this panel that I want to throw out here and see how you deal with them. But I wonder if um, if if everyone's okay with it, if we could all turn our cameras on now and kind of have a, a broader conversation. So um, I'll start by just opening the floor to the to the panelists. Uh, what do you think? What what what's your response to those? What are what do you what's in your heads right now? Well, I would love to pick up on a whole bunch of things that Lisa said, and we don't, we, uh, Lisa, we, we need to go for a beer sometime because I just think you've got so many interesting things to say. Um, I, I really appreciate the philosophical um, larger picture approach of your thinking because, you know, most of us who are working on the day-to-day -day grind of building an offering, uh, programming that can fall into the micro-credential category, don't have the, the time and the kind of intellectual space to have that thinking. And I, I actually appreciate very much the philosophical um, critique that you're making around micro-credentialing. So then, then I want to put that aside and, and think about the the comments that you made at the beginning about where continuing education um, may or may not be participating in this conversation. And I really want to make the distinction between personal and professional development. So continuing education that contributes to professional development is very different than taking a French course potentially. I mean, it may that may be professional development, but that's a very different kind of continuing education than many colleges and universities, yes, universities uh, offer. So I, I, I think what I, I take as most important from what you have said in your critique, and it's a really valid one, is the, the, the capitalistic threat that uh, dismantles the notion of the university as a place where people learn to contribute to be part of a civil society. And it, instead of going and studying towards some immediate gain and the, the shifting of risk is such an important point. And I would love to hear you say more about that um, in terms of that personal responsibility that should actually be lying with um, corporations or professions or, or the employer. So if you have a look at the data, um, it's very hard to find, like it's, you know, really um, needle and haystack type stuff. But if, 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 you, if you have a look at the data over decades, you can see that employers have systematically um, disinvested in, in, their, in, in their education and training. And they expect, they expect individuals to hit the ground running, to be work, you know, not just work ready, but work experienced. Um, and I think, um, and that's particularly the case for unregulated occupations, which is the majority of the labour market. Um, it's a bit different for regulated occupations like nursing and um, engineering, which have sequence paced um, workplace learning uh, embedded in their, in, in their programs. And so where you have a situation in societies like ours where, um, and I say that because it's very different in, in Europe where there's much higher levels of unionization, many more regulated occupations. For example, in Germany, there's 325 apprenticeships. You can't get a job as a bank teller unless you've done the bank teller apprenticeship. And I, I you know, um, we, we, don't, we, we don't have that system. And so um, the Australian data, which is what I know the best, only half of the workforce is employed in continuing full-time employment with um, access to benefits. Um, the rate of unionisation has collapsed. And so what's happened in that time is that employers have disinvested the amount of time and money they put into individuals and they expect them on their own dime to either come ready with these sorts of things or to go off and do them. Um, and so individuals have to second guess all the time. Um, what should they be doing? How should they be doing it? And there are differences in the kinds of access to knowledge that people have about what they should be doing. So it advantages those who are already advantaged. Um, so if, if we look at both recognition of prior learning, who gets the most recognition of prior learning? It's those who've already got the most credentials. Um, if we look at uh, micro-credentials, who gets the most benefit from that? It's those who've already got um, sustained qualifications. So, so what we should be asking is who is at risk here? And what do they, and, and, and what's the minimum as a society that we should be making sure that people have? And for me, as a minimum, um, we should be ensuring that our, our policy focus, our public money and our public policy is focused on making sure that people get a meaningful credential that allows them to participate in society and the labour market and that we shift 
the expectation to employers to start to invest more in um, education and training. Some employers do do that, but um, it, it's it's no longer a um, an expectation in the same way it was, say, 20, 30 years ago. Just mindful that we're uh, we're <clears throat> coming into our question period, but I have one question that I wonder that just builds on that while uh, while some questions are coming in. So if you're in the audience, please throw throw questions at us. Um, but I just want to ask this question then: if we're if if we're concerned about the fact that employers have disinvested in this area, and micro credentials are at least in some definitions explicitly intended to link employers to institutions to provide that kind of uh, connection to a credential through co-developing training, co-developing that uh, what, what they need. Is that one way to start towards this? And I'm just looking to the, to the rest of the panel. I mean, is that is that something that uh, starts to address that? And then I guess the other side of that is how do we get at those employers who are continuing to not do that and not engage? Panelists. Well, I'll just jump in very quickly. I mean, we, we have an enormous free rider problem um, in in the labour market in in Canada um, and in other systems which are uh, which are similar. Um, employers don't want to invest um, in training when they don't have to pay for it. I mean, I think it's quite different to from things like say um, getting your first aid certificate or um, you know health and safety things where employers are prepared to perhaps come to the party to some extent because there's there's regulatory requirements. I don't think there's any magic bullet for getting employer involvement in this. Colleges have been trying to do it for decades. And um, you know, I think that, that they've got a better understanding of it than, than universities, putting aside faculties of engineering and nursing and all of that sort of thing. So I, I don't think that um, say, you know, using this to drive collaboration between employers and um, uh, um, uh, educational institutions is going to solve the free rider problem. If if governments want to solve the free rider problem, they have to that, that they have to regulate. Um, and that there's an absolute abhorrence in our kinds of systems for any form of government regulation um, of the of employers. And so, you know, if that's going to be the case, then governments cannot complain when they say that there's weak links between um, um, educational credentials and jobs because it's actually the way employers use those credentials. Um, I mean, if we if we could get everyone a job who works in you know um, who's done a business diploma an appropriate job, we would. You know, it's it's you know we are not the problem here. Um, in, in that sense, I think. So if governments want closer connections, then the emphasis, the policy work has to be on getting employers to come to the, the party rather than um, always finding fault in educational institutions for not giving employers what they want. So uh, we've got a question here from the audience about, uh, I might throw this one to you, Sahel, to start us off. Employers and educators don't seem to be speaking the same language about this. It seems like part of the issue here. Uh, could micro credentials be part of a common, a new common language? That's a great question, actually. And I think the answer, like, I mean, simplistically, the answer is like yes. Um, I think the some of the nuance it comes. So we ran this really interesting um, cold calling campaign last year where we just randomly called employers, like really randomly called employers. We're talking directors, whether you know it's HR, CTOs, CEOs of small startups, just to introduce ourselves, basically to see what appetite there was uh, for employers to contribute. So I think number one, this idea that employers don't wanna contribute, I don't know if it's entirely true or don't wanna invest. I think it's more, what do they want to invest in and where are they gonna get the biggest or the greatest reward? So that's sort of, I think one thing. Um, the other piece is um, I think if if we can bring employers together to address very specific talent gaps and talent gaps that sort of exist uh, broadly within industry, um, what you'll start to notice is the conversations kind of shift. If I we've we've done a lot of like post postmortems, for instance, on why things haven't worked, and I can tell you that ninety percent of the micro credentials that we've tried to launch. Um, have failed to even start or failed to sort of move at all because that industry collaboration wasn't there at a, at a broader level. 
you can always get a single employer to contribute. Like you'll find one person to always help you, but the challenge is how do you get a large group? And the benefit of getting that larger group to contribute because they all, they're all solving the exact same problem, which is talent, right? If you bring them all together, what you start to see is, is them having conversations not only with you about what they want, but then they start to see value in the different ways they do things. So you bring a whole group of, let's say, software engineers, front-end developers, you bring them together and say, hey, we're trying to build a micro-credential in this area. Is there an actual problem? What specifically is the problem? And what do you look for in a front-end developer? And if I'm, you know, Suhail Inc., I'm the, you know, whatever, lead software engineer, at Suhail Inc., I can say, you know, this is what we do and this is what I'm looking for. And, you know, at Nick Inc., they're like, well, you know, we don't really do that, but there might be value in sort of doing that. So if we can sort of be the hub, I think the, the, the micro credential, one of the potentials it has is it's a hub. It's a hub for learners to get talent. It's a hub for employers to get talent. And I think it's a hope, it's a, it's a hub for sort of the community get better and more sort of prosperous, I guess, is the best way to, to, for me to put it. Nick, can I just add yeah, to that? Yeah, jump yeah, in sure. there. Yeah, I, th I think part of the problem, going back to the original question, you know, employers and educators don't seem to be speaking the same language. And I, and I would agree because micro-credentials is a relatively new term. So often when you're talking to the public or you're talking to employers, they have no idea. They may have heard of it, but they're not even sure what it is. And I would say that, you know, by following this trend of using that, that lingo, which seems to be pretty trendy now, um, I think we deceive people, or, or we, maybe we don't deceive them, but we confuse them because the reality is that individuals who come to, uh, to receive training outside of a traditional degree, when they're looking for very specific skills and competencies are based on that language. It's skills and competencies. That's the language that the, that the corporate world recognizes. So when we design programs, we're, we're often, to, that's the, the, you know, the bottom line, that's the foundation is based on, on those two things. Um, that's the communication that needs to go out. That's what we need to emphasize. I don't think we do a good job of that of institutions of highlighting the skills and competencies within programs. We have these learning, learning outcome statements that don't often even make it to you know, broad daylight. We use them because we have to get it approved by Senate or whoever. But I think we need to do a, do a better job of promoting skills and, and competencies within our programs. Don't worry too much about micro-credentials because that's the term being used today for something that's very short. Three, you know, two, three years from now, I don't know, maybe they'll change it and be another term that we'll be using. But I think that's a, a, an issue that we can repair, we can take care of. We do have another question here in the chat, folks. Uh, what does uh, bringing industry partners together look like beyond just departmental partnerships? How do we begin to operationalize the communication strategy of presenting micro-credentials as an investment tool for industry? I'll put that to the, anyone on the panel. I, I mean, I. I, I think that's a very good question. I, so government policies have um, have focused in in England, Australia, um, Canada on on information from um, educational, you know, how to improve it, uh, collaboration with employers from education side, but they haven't actually invested in any um, sorts of uh, collaborative arrangements on the industry side of things. So, or, and in our work in Australia, we found that the, um, that occupational, uh, occupations within industries were far more sexually differentiated than were the colleges and universities. So the colleges and universities actually worked together far more than any sort of advisory bodies did um, in the industries. And so our suggestion there was to actually try to seek to create bodies that brought together university trained occupations and college trained occupations in industry type bodies to talk, so that they could talk about um, discussing what kinds of uh, uh, credentials are needed, what kinds of occupational pathways should be constructed. And in our work, we've always found that where there, um, where there are strong occupational pathways, you will have strong educational pathways. So it's the, it's the structures of the labour market that drive pathways, not what we do. So it's a way, I, I think governments, if they want more of this sort of thing, they need to invest in creating advisory frameworks for industry to develop coherence around the kinds of things that they're asking of educational institutions. 
And if I could just quickly add to that with a specific example that we had here at SFU, DigiBC, which is an umbrella organization that represents digital employers in that sector, did a survey of their employers and discovered that students that were coming, graduates that were coming into the workforce were missing a, a fairly easily identified set of key competencies. And so in the last round of calls for proposals for micro-credentials, uh, one of the faculties here at SFU put in a proposal to build a micro-credential that would specifically provide these this skill set for this particular industry. And what was interesting about that was the actual interest came from the industry group. And without the funding from government to support the development of the micro-credential, it wouldn't have been able to happen in the same way. So there, those opportunities do pop up every now and again. Yeah, I, I've been involved in very similar things in Australia before I came here where at the, in the credit side of the house, um, the whole programming that was being driven by an industry that came to the, to the institutions and said, you're not quite meeting what we, what we think needs to happen. Um, so can we figure something out together? And, and they, they put money on the table to make that happen too. But the interesting thing in that context was that there were, there was, uh, it was the entire industry coming to sector, coming to the, to the higher education sector. So mining education came together and said, we need to figure this out because <clears throat> either we have to add some additional programming or change the way that we uh, set up our bachelor's programs. Um, and, and I wonder that sometimes too, if we if we're consistently hearing this message from industry that says, and I, I realize we've only got four minutes left, but we've if we hear this message from industry that says your, your graduates are not quite what we want, maybe there is something because our natural response is I don't think so. I think you're just not doing what you need to do. You need to expect less or expect expect something different of graduates coming out of this program. But is there something to it? Because there is there is quite a bit of research that shows that. Uh, that some skills decline from the entrance to the end of a, of a bachelor's program. So there may be some, maybe then the conversation should really be about identifying what those gaps are. Maybe there are some, some foundational gaps that don't get addressed uh, because of the way that we set up our programming here in, in, uh, in higher education. I don't know. That's... Yeah, if I could just oh, add I'll something quickly. I know, I know some of the research on micro credentials often points to the fact that uh, you know the, the skills and competencies are always hard skills and competencies and left out are soft skills which a lot of the corporate world look for and so a lot of times that's where the deficiency lies because we focus and fail to develop the soft skills within certain programs by using specific st strategies for assessment and that could be improved i mean we can all improve on that uh, but again you have to work with industry to understand what are the specific soft skills Perfect example of a report, I think it was out of Sweden, where you know um, it was computer engineers were graduating with wonderful skill sets, but when they were brought into the workplace, they couldn't run a meeting, they couldn't work together. Those are simple soft skills that you would think somebody would have, and yet they didn't. So you know the universities in that region went back and rethought how they were teaching and decided to create more you know collaborative and, and uh, experiential kind of opportunities for people to practice those skills. And I think one of the challenges there is that a micro credential is probably not going to solve that. That's the best, not the best place for that. Soft skills take time to learn and develop. Those are those things that we should be focusing on. Um, you know, it's it's relatively easy to teach someone a new programming language for a particular task. It's not so easy to teach them how to communicate or work in a group. Um, we yeah, we do have one more question. In single I, course either. Yeah, that's right. Can I just can I just just jump in actually? Just one really quick note. I think uh, obviously soft skills are really good. I think technical technical skills in absence are really in the absence of soft skills or transversal skills are not really valuable. Soft skills uh, in the absence of like technical skills aren't really valuable as well. And then I think we also have to understand the nuances between the technical skill and the transversal skill. So for example, if we you know look at um, uh, leadership. Leadership is a really good one. Or coaching. Well, leadership is probably the best one. If you look at what it means to be a leader as a software developer, it's very, very different than what it means to be a leader in the practical nursing environment. So I think it's really, it's, it's difficult to create soft skills, sort of micro-credentials in the absence of like a technical sort of environment. And obviously our assessments should, should definitely put the two together. 
Well, thank you uh, very much, everyone, for a great conversation. We're down to our last few minutes or a few seconds here, I guess. So on behalf of eCampus uh, Ontario, I'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, for attending today and leading us in this great discussion. Uh, and thank you for all that attended and for the great questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.